we'll just give it a, a couple more minutes. It's 131, so we'll give people some time. Um, I'm really excited. This is like one of my favorite ways to learn about Glenview in the Victorian era. And we're kind of kicking off the Halloween season, uh, the spooky season, um, and packing a lot of, a lot of fun activities um, and learning activities into the next week, uh, working toward the big day, as it were, which I'm sure this will be a very different Halloween from, from the usual. But, um, but we are in the process now at, at the Hudson River Museum of not only continuing our virtual programming, but um, starting to, uh, to do some live events and, uh, and programs again, uh, observing social distancing guidelines, certainly. Uh, so just about everything is going to be held, is being held outside in our courtyard. So um, important to bundle up. We've been very lucky so far. Um, we've had uh, we've had yoga, we've had salsa, we've had a concert, we have science demos every Sunday, uh, and next weekend we are going to have uh, wonderful programs for Halloween and for Dia de Muertos over the weekend. And Friday night we have an adult-only program from six to eight in the courtyard. Uh, with Tom Lee, who is an incredible storyteller, a very spooky tale from Norway called Thornbush Bride. And our very own uh, Mark Taylor is going to be looking at the sky above and at the full moon, because how convenient there is going to be a full moon on Halloween. So um, we have lots, lots, lots going on around Glenview. And uh, in preparation uh, for being, being allowed inside at some point in the near future. So um, uh, ladies, are we just about ready? We have 36, oh, we have 36, 37. Uh, yes, and we are live on Facebook. So hello to everybody on Facebook. Excellent. Well. Hi, Olivia, hi. Well, um, I, uh, this is Sarah Linda Licklow, uh, Director of Education, and I want to um, welcome all of you here to our program about morning with a U in Glenview uh, to kick off our spooky season. And I want to thank Olivia Cipri Cipriano for her uh, program management here, and also our curator, Laura Vukels and our assistant curator, Victoria McKenna Ratchin, um, for putting together this really interesting um, and intriguing program uh, about how the Trevor family would have um, dealt with uh, the passing of friends and family, uh, which reflected some very interesting, we might say curious uh, and widespread morning customs during the Victorian era. So um, I think without further ado, since we are now um, admit, still admitting people, but uh, since it is time to begin, I'm gonna turn the program over to Laura Vogels and Victoria McKenna Ratchin. Um, please, everybody, we want to hear from you. Um, post your comments, post your questions in the chat, and they will be um, looked at at the end of the presentation. So once again, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. Laura, take it away. Hi everyone. Um, why don't we just, uh, Olivia, if we could have the next slide, some of these things, uh, Sarah Linda already went over, just introducing ourselves, uh, I, Victoria, Olivia, and Sarah Linda are all helping out with this program today. And everyone's audio uh, is off by default, but feel free to be asking us questions, which we'll, we will get to at the end. If we could have the next slide. We just, uh, Today, the topics, as we mentioned, are morning in Glenview, but really uh, similarly to how we did with the costume talk, we're going to be using Glenview to spring out into a larger arena of Ameri American and British uh, morning traditions. 
And then uh, we're going to talk about how that related to fashion for mourning, mementos for the dead and your loved ones. And I just did want to say that we felt like we should put a trigger warning on this program. I have a feeling that probably if you came to hear a presentation on Victorian mourning that you're aware that we're going to be talking about death. And there are actually a couple of images that do show uh, the deceased. Um, but we just wanted to make sure everyone realizes that. Could we have the next slide, please? So as I, as I always do, uh, because we are not at Glenview, we're work, we are working remotely and not everybody maybe on the call has ever been to Glenview. So I always just start by showing uh, some pictures of Glenview to give us a little bit of context. This is a picture of what Glenview looks like today when uh, on the left when you walk out from the into the courtyard from our modern building. And this is a photograph of it in around 1885. You can see it looks very similar, particularly how we have restored the front of the roof with the nice uh, tiles up there. But there was a little bit more extensive porches you can see on the front of it. And we're gonna see a picture of that. It might even be the next slide, Olivia. No, not quite. I just wanted to give you a sense of what the inside of Glenview looks like. On the left, you have the Great Hall. When you would enter Glenview from the front door, you would see the Great Hall and the steps that lead up to the family's rooms. And then on the right, we have an image of the library. Just to, again, to give you a little bit of orientation. Next slide, please. So we're going to start out with a little bit about mourning and how it relates to the Trevor family when they lived at Glenview. Glenview was built in 1876 and 1877, and the Trevors moved into it in 1877. Mary Trevor, uh, who is on the left, was not born at Glenview, but moved there as a very uh, young girl. And then on the right, we have her father, John Von Trevor, who was a Wall Street financier who built Glenview, which is in Yonkers, New York. I think most of you know that, but just to as a review. And so I, I start with these two pictures uh, for a very specific reason. Mr. Trevor died in 1890 and uh, he did die in the city, but um, so at the museum, we have this portrait of Mr. Trevor and it was painted in 1893. So it was painted three years after his death by an artist named Harper Pennington. And so, and it's the only oil portrait that we know of Mr. Trevor. There are some photographs. There was an engraving that was in a history book uh, about Westchester that was produced in the 1880s. But so if you were wealthy, one thing that you might do after someone died is, is you would want an oil painting of them. And from my research on Harper Pennington, it seems like that is what this artist would do. Um, in, in two more cases, I found evidence of people gave the artist a photograph of someone who was deceased and he produced a very lifelike portrait in color from the black and white photograph. One person was a woman relative of Mr. Trevor's, I believe one of his cousins, and the other person was a university president who was being honored, um, you know, posthumously, and, and so they had a portrait made by Harper Pennington. On the left, I show this, uh, port this photographic portrait of Mary Talmadge Trevor Winthrop because I believe that the reason that she's wearing black in this photograph is in uh, mourning for her father. He died in, in December of 1890. And this is probably shortly after that, uh, maybe no later than 1893. You can kind of tell in the 1890s from how the sleeves progress. Uh, the size of these sleeves makes it look like early 1890s. Next slide, please. So, um, then Mary Trevor got married to Grenville Winthrop in 1892. And this is a diorama that we had set up in an exhibition 
in the year 2000 and we don't have any of the wedding dress or anything that was specifically from Mary Trevor's wedding but we wanted to evoke it so we put up a backdrop of St. John's Church in Yonkers which is where Mary Trevor got married and when she got married it was only about a year and a half after her father died and so the person that we have shown in black here on the mannequin is meant to represent Mrs. Trevor who wore mourning at the wedding, which is something that etiquette books advised against. You weren't, if you were in mourning, you weren't really supposed to go out to parties or go to a wedding or anything festive like that, unless you had a very good reason. So if you were the mother of the bride, you had a very good reason that you would want to be there, uh, but you still, would wear your widow's weeds as they called them. Next slide, please. So uh, unfortunately and sadly, Mary Trevor only lived to the year 1900. And so we showed her before in mourning for her father in this picture on the porch of Glenview, I believe what's going on here is that everyone is in mourning for her. We have in the picture her mother on the left, her sister on the right in the background. I believe that is her husband, Grenville Winthrop. It also looks a lot like his brother, Beekman. And then in the foreground is her daughter, Emily. So we have the three Emilies. Mary named her oldest daughter, Emily, after her sister and her mother. And this would have been, you know, around like 1901 or 1902 right after Mary died. And on the right, we have the New York Times announcement of her death saying that she died uh, at Glenview after a short illness. We're really not sure what that was. It, it could have been something related to her having given birth less than a year before and that the Glen funeral services were going to be at Glenview. So in a few minutes, Victoria will talk to you a little bit about the fact that many funerals were at people's homes and that it was going to be on a Tuesday morning and that a special train car was going to leave Grand Central Station to bring people up from the city to go to the funeral. And these kinds of things were arranged often by the wealthy. People came up on special train cars also to go to her wedding. Next slide, please. So this is another just now that I have revealed to you the subtext uh, behind these photographs seems very poignant. Emily Trevor, who was not married and never married, uh, having a little you know, picnic, <laughs> bringing the, the expensive uh, antique carpets out from the house to put on the lawn to sit there. And here is the baby who was slightly less than one year old when Mary died. Uh, the baby's name was Kate. And so we have the two Emilies and Kate out by the Japanese maple on the lawn of, of Glenview. Next slide, please. So I, I wanted to show a picture of the parlor because from what we know, Mrs. Uh, Emma, Mary Trevor and then later Mrs. Trevor both were laid out in state in the parlor of Glenview and the funerals were held in the house. And this is an article from the Yonkers Statesman, December 4th, 1900, pointing out that the funeral is going to be at Glenview and describing it in great detail. The Episcopalian minister from Grace Church in New York City, where they would go to church when they were in New York City, came up to do it. It says they read from Corinthians, they sang Rock of Ages, and the casket stood there surrounded by palms and flowers. And then that she was actually transported up to uh, Greenwood Cemetery to be buried with the Winthrop family. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, the, the Trevors had a lot of greenhouses and a lot of flowers. I, I, it doesn't say that the flowers came from Glenview, which it did say when she got married. So it, if it was in December, then possibly you know, they would have had to supplement the flowers from elsewhere also, but they could, they could have been from Glenview too. Next slide, please. So then, as I mentioned, the other funeral that was held at Glenview later 
was when Mrs. Trevor died in 1922, thus kicking off the series of events that led to the founding of the museum at uh, Glen, Glenview. Uh, before that, since 1919, it had been at City Hall in Yonkers and there was a mineral collection there. And then after Mrs. Trevor died in 1922, the city bought the property and turned it into the museum. But there was a very long article in the Yonkers paper starting out like this uh, on the front page saying Mrs. Trevor dies at home. She was 82 years old. Um, she lived over 30 years longer than Mr. Trevor. She had been a, young, a bit younger than him. And then it mentions again that the funerals are going to be at her late home. I guess they already know the home is, is going to be due to be sold. Uh, and that uh, again, a special uh, train is leaving Grand Central to bring people to come up to the service. And again, the officiant from Grace Church is going to be there. Now, Mrs. Trevor is with the other Trevors at Woodlawn. Uh, next slide, please. So Victoria is going to start to tell you a little bit about some of these Victorian household mourning traditions that would have been followed by the Trevors and other families of, of all classes during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Victoria? Yeah, so we wanted to move into more generalized Victorian traditions, um, things that the Trevors would have grown up knowing about, participating in, and would have um, dealt with throughout the deaths within their own family, but also within people that they know and within society themselves. On this slide, um, an example, we have an example from the collection of a memorial card. Um, they, would been, they would have been supplied by the undertaker and um, they were very similar to kind of how we have memorial cards now at funerals where right now we tend to have maybe a photograph or a painting and on the back their name, some information about um, the person, maybe a poem or a prayer. These were very, very similar. They were a bit larger than what we typically have now. They were supplied by the undertakers and they were often black or silver and white and they would have lots of the iconography of the time. Um, this one had some religious iconography. Otherwise, it would also have things like weeping willows or urns or inverted torches, things that kind of brought over from Puritan times where you see lots of that type of imagery. Um, and they were intended as reminders for the dead for the people who were visiting the funeral and the wakes so that they can be sure to have prayers for that deceased person. And it would uh, be kind of a memento for everyone who came by. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is an example set up from another museum, but it's very similar to how it would have been done at Glenview. Um, the tradition was very common at the time for, um, like Laura had mentioned, funerals would be held within the home, usually in a parlor or another kind of great entertaining room. Um, something that would have been easily accessible and also a grand room, it would look really nice. Um, some of the traditions, lots of the traditions for the household are stemmed also in superstition and beliefs at that time. So mirrors were covered, but also family portraits and images of the deceased would be covered um, with shrouds or fabric or anything that they really had because it was believed that it could trap the spirit of the dead person who had passed. Um, they were also, the bodies were also would always be carried out of the house heaps first because there was a tradition and a superstition that if they were carried out any um, head first from the home, they could beckon someone to follow them. So it was seen as very disastrous to do something like that. You'd be kind of, um, you'd be kind of damning someone. Um, clocks were stopped. One of the main reasons for that, that would have been very practical, would be recording the time of death very accurately, especially if someone lived very far away from when like a coroner could come or the undertaker could come. Um, so we would, they would stop clocks, but then also they would believe that if the clock wasn't stopped, it would bring bad luck to the household and also possibly urge the spirit to kind of stay around and kind of kind of curse the, the house. So like I had mentioned, funerals took place at home. These are two images of funerals within homes. One of them is a person within their coffin with lots of flowers. 
the other is a child within a bed. Um, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> Usually these types of, um, these services and wakes would last for a couple of days. That was partially to, partially to make sure that the deceased was actually dead. Um, sometimes in cases of illness or coma, the person might wake up and that's where you kind of get the term wake from. Um, for that same reason, some coffins at the time were equipped with bells and undertakers and graveyard uh, caretakers would be able to hear in case someone was buried alive. Um, um, another reason for a longer wake would be just because family li possibly lived further away, more people could, would be able to visit it. <laughs> uh, modern embalming really wasn't popularized yet. Um, that was usually in the United States that was pretty much popularized with Lincoln and around the Civil War. Um, before that, there weren't many good ways to preserve a body, so lots of flowers would have been used, lots of candles as well. Move to the next slide. So in this photo, this is a living photo to my knowledge. It is not a postmortem, um, and I just thought it was one of the cutest things ever. But um, women were really the primary caretakers within their families, and that extended into death rites. Women would have um, dressed the deceased, would have washed them, would have been in charge of the household and all of the traditions within that. So children were, especially young girls, were kind of inundated with this by, with their dolls. There would be um, sets for funeral and funeral processions and coffins and different things like that to get them used to and kind of practicing within taking care of what their future roles in a household would be. And unfortunately, it wasn't very uncommon for children to die and women to die during childbirth during this time. So children were in no way hidden from the fact of, of that people would die or mortality, kind of how we might do now. Um, they were really exposed to the realities of that. They might have siblings that would pass away or know of siblings that came before them, friends, family members, their own mother might pass. Um, so they had to be very aware of these things. Next slide. <clears throat> a tr one of my favorite traditions, which we're unsure if it really would have happened at the at the at Glenview, because we're not sure if they actually kept the bees or not. But people within Westchester would have kept bees. Is a tradition of telling the bees. Um, it's a practice that uh, many people believe had its origins in Celtic mythology, where the presence of a bee after death signified the soul leaving the body. Um, but it was a very prominent tradition in the US and Western Europe to notify the bees of major events in the beekeeper's life. So typically you would shroud the, the hives in black and you would knock on the individual hives and tell them that someone had passed away. And <clears throat> to not do this could result in either the hive dying or, the, or them leaving, which would have dire consequences at a time when these are still very, very important to us now, but let alone back then when you would kind of use honey very often or you would um, have gardens for all of your produce. And it wasn't just unhappy events that the bees were told of, they were also told of weddings, which I love. And sometimes the hives would be adorned with flowers and they'd be given cake. So you'd give them little bits of the wedding cake and they'd also be invited to that kind of party as well. Next slide. <clears throat> Moving out of um, household traditions and into fashion. Um, now, um, this image is of the five daughters of Prince Albert and Queen Victoria, and it was after their father's death. So you can see the bust of Prince Albert there. Um, mourning dress was incredibly important to, in Victorian tradition, and it had varying rules depending on your age and your gender. So men typically only had to wear black bands on their sleeves when someone died. Um, if their wife died, though, they were expected to wear all black but they were allowed to return to work and they could remarry at their discretion ending their mourning. So they really had a lot of flexibility with that. Women, however, were kept at much stricter um, traditions with this. Uh, typically close relatives to this deceased, especially a widow would be expected to dress in mourning for at least two years. And those years were broken down into different stages. Uh, next slide. So this, is a, this slide shows a great example of the first type of stage, which would be full mourning, which you see on the left, which um, <clears throat> lasted for a year and one day. And it would have, you would wear all black, it would be dull clothing, 
Um, there was no ornamentation allowed, no jewelry except for black jewelry. So typically jet or ebonized wood. Um, and it was the most common uh, way to set, set this apart from the others would be the veil. So you would have a morning veil and it would be covering your face at all times. And women were not at this point, were not allowed to join social events. They were only really expected to leave the home for church. Um, second morning would be after that, the year in one day, it would be for nine months. And usually it was very similar to full morning, but the veil would be worn back. And you would allow for some more fancy trim, some non-black uh, jewelry, but you still kind of wanted to keep it dull. And most older widows um, stayed in this stage for the rest of their lives, similar to how Queen Victoria did after the death of Albert. Um, and Laura mentioned it's believed that possibly Mrs. Trevor stayed in this stage of mourning for the rest of her life. And the final stage, which you see on the right of this, is called half mourning. And it's a period between three to six months. And usually you can allow more um, elaborate fabrics. You could start wearing normal jewelry again, and you would start bringing color back in. And the most popular colors were usually white, purple, grays, and even dark red was pretty popular. So you still didn't want anything super bright, but you could start bringing things back into your wardrobe. And even though Victorian etiquette books really stress that morning dress should be plain and simple, it goes against the fact that it was still fashion. So it was usually extremely elaborate if you had the money for it. And it was a great way to show status. Um, next slide, please. This is another example. This is from the Met's exhibition, Death Becomes Her, A Century of Mourning Attire from 2014, which was an amazing exhibition. And this is just a great slide to kind of show the different styles, but um, not only aesthetically, but within the different stages of mourning. Next slide. <clears throat> As I mentioned, mourning was a great way to show wealth um, uh, within a household and for women. Some even went so far as to dress their entire household staff, so their servants, in mourning when the head of the household passed away, which would be extremely expensive. Uh, middle and lower class women would also go to great lengths to appear fashionable, and sometimes they would dye their clothing back and then black, and then they would bleach it afterwards as a way to kind of get the best of both worlds. However, the industry for mourning became such a vital, um, lucrative path for tailors that there were rumors that started spreading that reusing funeral attire was actually bad luck, which is kind of what you get now where you kind of, it's bad luck to be seen in the same outfit more than once, especially at like maybe weddings. It's very similar to that with the way funerals were then. So mourning was a huge business and it was, um, there would be great huge emporiums. So you see an ad here for um, Jay's Emporium, which was all morning fashion. It would, you would be able to go into a store and it would just be clothing for morning. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, next slide. So moving into some of the ornamentation that would have been allowed, um, jet is the most popular um, accessory uh, material that you would have, which you see on the left. Queen Victoria popularized popularized jet, which is a variety of fossilized coal after Prince Albert died. It was very expensive, however, so lots of different kinds of um, alternate materials were able to be used as well, kind of to give the same effect of it so that you weren't seeing it splashy, but you could still be fashionable and pretty cost effective. Um, ebonite was one of them, which is also known as vulcanite. It was a hard, it was a hard rubber. So it was the most mass produced rival to jet because it was um, able to be molded and not had to be carved as a stone. And middle and lower class families would be able to get jewelry out of this material because it would be much more um, cost effective and it wouldn't be as labor intensive. Other um, alternatives that were more cost effective than actual jet would have been black glass and ebonized wood. So the brooch on the right is made out of ebonized wood and it depicts, it's a very, it depicts a very popular uh, motif during mourning, in mourning jewelry that's signaled by um, the somber color, but also the hand. So it's typically kind of colloquially known as a Victorian mourning hand. You get them very often on uh, headstones. You get them in jewelry in different ways. They're often shown holding flowers. Um, this one is clutching a U wreath and U would have been, um, 
a plant that was associated with cemeteries and mourning, often you wreaths would also be hung on doors to show that people were mourning within that home. And um, so that would be a very popular fashionable item. Next slide. Hi, I was going to jump in here. I wanted to show two portraits that are in the museum's collection that you could see in our sitting room when we reopened Glenview. These are portraits of Mrs. Christian Henry Lilienthal and her son, John James Lilienthal, who had died. And we think that probably this portrait was painted after the child had died. And if you look closely at the portrait of Mrs. Lilienthal, you will see that she is wearing uh, what appears to be jet jewelry in a parure when, when jewels are matching, you call them a parure, P-A-R-U-R-E. And uh, she's got a brooch and some ear, some dangling earrings and, and, a, and a black shawl. And this was in the 1870s and her child pictured here uh, died in the 1860s. So it just makes you wonder, is she wearing this jewelry still in remembrance of her child who died? Sadly, this child uh, fell down the stairs in their home, which was about a block north of where the museum is today. They had a beautiful home called Belvoir. And so, um, you know, she may be wanting to, to have this sense that she's still mourning her child. Next slide, please. I just wanted to show you a few examples of mourning jewelry from the museum's collection. The excellent examples that Victoria showed are not in our collection. And we do have a few things. Uh, they're probably made of, of a jet. Uh, they, they could often people uh, made things out of glass or they might dye tortoise shell or other materials because jet is after all a uh, sort of a semi-precious gem almost. But here we have a hair comb and this came with matching hair pins that are in the collection. And then we have some hat pins so that you could coordinate your whole ensemble with this jewelry. Next slide, please. So not only was um, fashion in incredibly important and jewelry, but we wanted to also talk about kind of mourning through artwork. And um, in this, we include paintings, but also photography, lithographs, and other kinds of jewelry that wouldn't have been, that was not just the jet jewelry that we showed before. So objects and motifs of memento mori, which literally means remember you must die, were prevalent long before Victorian times, were, but were incredibly imp important to Victorians. Um, shown here is a needlework in the museum's collection, um, and it reads absent but not forgotten. There's two photographs on it, which we really want to research more about. One, the one on the left is a man, and on the right is a woman with a child, and we're not sure exactly if this is a piece to memorialize all three of them or if it's something that most likely a woman in the family did for her husband or maybe her child we don't know enough about it but it was a very popular medium <clears throat> women would often use needlework it was a great craft for them it was a acceptable outlet and it was a very popular you get um, samplers as well um, the flowers in this could also, the blue ones could be forget-me-nots, which would also be kind of apropos to the topic. Next slide. Also incredibly popular were um, lithographs. So these are two lithographs in the museum collection, and they're published by Courier and Ives, and they would have been mass-produced. So typically, the uh, people would, could buy them, and then you would personalize the gravestones. Um, by adding individuals' information such as a poem or their name, just their name and their birth date and their death date. Um, the one on the left, you can see kind of this bright outline that would have been where hair was, and underneath it, there's a poem handwritten about hair. And on the right, there are three children's names listed. So um, <clears throat> these would have been incredibly popular, and they would have been kind of just ambiguous enough to be used by pretty much any family. I actually was able within my research to find a blank one. Uh, next slide. 
so within this one, this is how they would have been sold and in a kind of ambiguous background that could really be anywhere. Um, you see the um, lots of iconography, you see a urn on the top of the grave, grave site, you see a weeping willow and a kneeling woman praying and two children. So that could really be used by many families at the time. Next slide. So I also wanna talk about one of the great art forms of the train age, which would have been hair jewelry. So these unfortunately are not in the collection, but the next, in our next slide, we do have some that are part of our collection. Um, although mourning jewelry had been produced for nearly 2000 years, it really reached its peak in the Victorian age. And in, in America, it reached its peak during the Civil War. And hair art was incredibly popular. Um, it started as a simple way to keep a loved one near, and it became a very elaborate art practice. So you could take hair and weave it. So you can see some examples here of really all the different types. On the right, you just see kind of like a lock of hair lovingly kind of curled. You can also see it weaved and plaited in some jewelry. And then also this large one that says, in memory of AG, you can tell. Um, that that black that not really black but that very dark brown that's actually hair and you can see it's almost as if it's a painting but using the hair of the loved one next slide yes i i think that sometimes for those other ones that aren't the woven hair they would actually crush up the hair and make an ink out of it and and then glue it into these pictures uh we have some you know i've seen a lot of different kinds of examples I did, uh, Victoria said I wanted to show something from the collection. The piece on the left is a bracelet in the museum's collection and you see in it a tiny tin type of the deceased so that you could wear this bracelet, presumably made from the hair of the deceased. Uh, although if it's a man, I, I don't know, you know, they may have had to supplement sometimes with other hair. But, um, and and this very intricately made, is in a kind of braiding and macrame technique. Um, and they're very similar, like uh, particularly on the right. And I have to confess, I have a personal connection with this tradition because uh, I have family that came from France in the 1840s and this was their profession that they made hair jewelry and wigs they were came into new orleans harbor and they lived in memphis Tennessee. so these are pieces in my own collection but this kind of hollow sort of basket woven technique you see in so many different jewels they must have made it from a particularly pa a pattern that was known by people that did this craft particularly the earrings in the lower picture I've seen in other museum collections and other online resources, this exact type of earring with the three dangles and the sort of hollow woven um, hair technique. So um, people would, you know, do this, they could do it for a loved one who wasn't deceased, but, but you typically associate this art form with a remembrance for the dead. And it seems maybe a little creepy today, but, but if you think about it, often people save a lock of hair from someone, from your baby the first time they get their hair cut or some such. I, I think it's a little um, disingenuous for us to think this is very creepy because it's, it's not so far from some of our contemporary uh, memorial practices. Uh, next slide, please. So we had a question earlier um, on if we would be covering um, postmortem photography, and that was an incredibly important art form to the Victorians. Um, so I wanted to talk about them a little bit here. These are two photographs that are within the collection. Um, one of them, the one on the left, is a woman holding her daughter who had passed away, and on the right is a woman within her own coffin. Um, the first successful form of photography was the daguerreotype and it was in super expensive luxury but it wasn't as costly as having your portrait painted as Laura had mentioned um, John Von Trevor's portrait had been painted after his death that was also a very popular thing to do but incredibly expensive so having a photograph taken really was a more cost-effective way um, and it was a way in which you can permanently preserve someone's image without having to spend all that money and in the mid 1800s, um, photography started being used mostly, not mostly, but 
that increasingly for this type of memento mori portraiture, um, you would have loved ones photographed after they had died. And even though it seems kind of morbid to our own sensibilities, in Victorian England, it was a very common way to commemorate the dead and blunting the sharpness of grief. You could have photographs that would be put on brooches. You can have them in these little, the daguerreotypes often are in these little kind of um, booklets almost, these little kind of boxes that you can carry with you. Um, and this is also during a time when <clears throat> photographs wouldn't be all that common generally you would so you wouldn't have it's not like today where you could take a lot of photos with your family with your friends not on your phone so it would have really been the last moment these families could document a beloved child or a beloved mother um, a sibling a husband or wife um, as the number of photographers increased and new types of photography was, was induced the cost of daguerreotypes daguerreotypes um, did uh, start falling. And the style of memorial portraiture kind of shifted from the actual representations of the dead to more the mourners themselves. You see people with um, within their mourning clothes, you see people at grave sites. Um, <clears throat> and then that started kind of taking the place of actual pictures of postmortem photography. And there's lots of different beliefs around postmortem photography. Lots of people think that if you can see a person being kind of propped up with a stand, that means that the person was probably dead. And it's kind of unlikely if they're standing for that to be the case, because at this time, photographs, the exposure on a photograph would have been so long. Um, to get a nice crisp photo, people would kind of be put in these kind of, um, kind of put in, I can't think of the right word to use, but you would be kind of like strapped in so that you didn't move around a lot so that you can get an actual crisp photo. And actually in some postmortem photography, that's actually a way that you can tell that this person is actually dead is if you have photos of someone who's living with their usually uh, parents with their children or a husband and their wife, the living person might be a little blurry actually. And then the person who's died will be very much more crisp. And it's because of that reason. Um, next slide please. Yeah, we were we were both reading up a little bit on this. Um, apparently, there is a, a big debate going on on the internet on whether or not some of the standing pictures you see of people could possibly be the be deceased people. It's more like I saw somebody in the chat was asking what kind of contraptions Victoria was talking about. It's more like a little brace for your neck or something just to make sure that you that you stay still during the picture. So what people have been pointing out is even though people look very almost dead in some of these pictures, it's more that it was just very uncomfortable to stand for such a long period in the early years of photography. And um, that if it was actually the, the weight of a dead body, some of those contraptions that you see in the photographs could never hold up someone who was not living. Uh, so, so yeah, but um, I, I wanted to point out uh, to, to lighten the moment uh, moving on from photographs of dead people, although it's, it's almost hard for us to realize in the 21st century, when you have a zillion photographs on your phone that you've never even bothered to print, what it would be like to lose a child and you were from a middle class or a lower middle class family and you had never had any reason to go to the photographer and have a photograph made of your baby. And so um, it's incredibly poignant and I think an incredibly important part of the grieving process that mothers might go to photographers to have a photograph made of their child. And, and some photographers advertised as specializing in that type of photography. But if you had enough money, you might do what the person on the left did here, which is actually like with Mr. Trevor, have someone make a painting of your baby instead of a photograph. And this is a painting in the museum's collection. The museum has a rather large collection of memorial photography and other artifacts of memorial art donated by Stanley B. Burns, a doctor who created a large collection of these materials uh, called the Burns Archive. And this 
painting was donated by Stanley Burns in the 1990s. And the reason that you know that the baby is meant to be in heaven is that he's, he or she is surrounded by clouds. So that's sometimes one of the clues when you see a painting, if it's meant to be a memorial painting, there might be clouds around the child. And that's one reason we're not 100% sure about the Lilienthal portrait that I showed earlier that's in the museum's collection. There's no kind of clouds or any kind of indication like that in the painting to show that it's meant that it was painted after the child's death. Um, and then, you know, so some things, uh, some types of memorial artifacts show how literal the Victorians could be, how close they felt to death and were not as uncomfortable about expressing that as we are sometimes these days. And in other ways, they were much more euphemistic. So, you know, we had earlier Courier and Ives prints showing people, you know, at actual grave sites. Here we have a print showing an angel taking a child up to heaven. So sometimes things were very much more uh, a little sideways like this, uh, stressing the fact that the departed would live on and, and, you know, those kinds of things rather than showing them deceased, showing them at grave sites. Could we have the next slide, please? So uh, this is another one of these cards that you could order. Um, I even found like catalogs online in the early 20th century where you could order various cards with various poems. And I was intrigued by the poem that's on the base of this card here. And then just again, you have, you know, in loving memory, something kind of general like that. You have some flowers, you have an angel. You do have someone weeping at a, at a cross-shaped gravestone. And then you have this poem at the bottom. And it's, you know, call not back the dear departed. So there's this sense of stressing that the person that's died has maybe gone on to a better place and you shouldn't be so, so uh, in despair. And mostly I have seen, and I saw it a million places, this was a very popular uh, poem to be uh, reproduced on these cards. And I couldn't find who wrote it. But I did find one place and only one place online where I saw the entire poem, which reveals that it's about mothers. And it was posted in the Railroad Brakeman's Journal. This person, George Totten, uh, gave a memorial uh, you know, announcement about his mother who died in Cairo, Cairo, Illinois. And so when you go on to read the rest of the poem, it says how we miss our loving mother. Um, so anyway, my point is uh, just like today when you go and you pick out the cards and you have the little things printed to give away to people at the visitation or the funeral. Uh, this was also a whole business. You know, often when I give tours of Glenview, I talk about the fact that the Victorian age is, is less a ye olde time and, and more the beginning of modern times. So many of these customs, they may seem a little strange to us, but things like this, having these cards, as Victoria said, are things we do today. You go and you pick out the card, you say which verse you want on it. This was a very popular verse. Next slide, please. So um, I wanted to end up uh, with a couple of ideas about this sort of mourning in Victorian times. One is uh, we talked about the importance of a photography and the one on the left here is very meta because you have a photograph within a photograph. So you have this little memorial decoration. Maybe it was made for the funeral. Maybe it was something that was going to be displayed in the home for a time. You have a portrait of the person who died. And then you have, um, it's sitting on something called a coffin plate. And so, you know, I wondered, well, what is a coffin plate? And it's sort of just what it sounds like, plate, not in as a dinner plate, but plate as in a plaque. It's a plaque that you have made to put on the coffin and it dates back all the way to the middle ages almost, but that was just for like wealthy people and kings. But in the 19th century, when things could be more, you know, like industrially manufactured, then you might, uh, anybody, might be able to afford to have a little plaque that went on the coffin during the visitation and the funeral and it, it probably had the person's name and then it had a few words but then you would take it off 
before you buried the coffin and keep it as a remembrance. So here, this coffin plate that says at rest, it almost looks like the at rest part has been worked out a little bit. So it shows up more, you know, maybe in some after effects, like the, the equivalent of 19th century Photoshop um, and made into this decoration. And so then on the right, I found on Wikimedia at the Library of Congress, they have a coffin plate from Abraham Lincoln's coffin. It has this eagle holding a flag. And this looks like maybe a, a laurel branch or oak branch. I'm sure someone will correct me. Um, so then that was you know, on Lincoln's coffin and uh, saved. And it, it made me want to close on this notion that sometimes a lot of what we've been talking about is personal grieving and personal mourning, but there is this sense that still exists today of a kind of collective mourning that we may go through. I can think of a few examples just in my lifetime, you know, people mourning for President Kennedy, people mourning uh, for Princess Diana. Um, and so uh, if we can see the next slide, please. Besides Prince Albert uh, in the United States, the, the best example of this is when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, the whole country was plunged into mourning. And uh, these are two uh, items that we have in our own collection. Um, we didn't really talk about it and show examples, but one of the things that you would do when you were in mourning is you might have special stationery for sending out thank you notes or whatever, and it would be banded in a wide black border. So when I was doing a little research, uh, we had a Civil War exhibit a couple of years ago, and I looked up some newspapers from the Yonkers uh, Statesman, and I think this one's the New York Times, yeah, in our collection about when Lincoln died, and I saw that they had created these wider black borders around the columns in the newspaper. They essentially made the whole newspaper into morning stationery, and they kept this up for several days, after Lincoln died. I, I don't remember exactly how many days, but the whole you know, newspaper was reflecting mourning from Lincoln. And then they brought his body, uh, Victoria mentioned embalming and Lincoln, they, they carried his body on a train all the way back from Washington to bury him in Illinois where he was from. And it was a whole event where people who were in mourning in the country knew when the train would arrive and they could wait and pay their respects as the train went by. And you may or may not know that the way to get to Chicago from New York is to go north to Albany and then across the country to Chicago. So the, the train with Lincoln's body came past Yonkers where the museum's located today and where Glenview's located. And here we see Acker uh, Merrill, a grocery store down by the train tracks where they were in downtown Yonkers. And they made a particular arch here that says Yonkers mourns with the nation. And then the Yonkers citizens could come and gather here and watch the train go by. And the typed uh, you know, label here is an old museum label from probably the 1930s or 40s that we found with the photograph that explained about the arch being built in the people in Yonkers morning. Next slide, please. And this is just a couple other examples of the popular demand to have this kind of collective mourning or interest in, uh, you know, the, the death of famous people. So on the left, we have a cabinet card of the grave of Washington Irving at Sleepy Hollow, which is in the collection. And he, Washington Irving is buried at Sleepy Hollow Cemetery, which, you know, the location of many of his spooky stories, like the legend of Sleepy Hollow, Ichabod Crane and all those things. And he is indeed buried there. And this was taken by an artist, uh, a photographer, um, Pierre Havens, who moved south in 1872. So this photograph was taken, he was from Austin originally, this photograph was taken at some time 
before he moved south and continued his photography career. And then on the right, a very curious relic, we have this brooch made of hair and you can kind of make out the tintype inside it is George and Martha Washington. So I'm kind of wondering what this could possibly be. Clearly this person probably did not have the hair of George or Martha Washington. Uh, my theory at the moment, which cannot be proven, is that possibly at the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia, which celebrated the century of the United States, it really kicked off an interest in the colonial times. People were celebrating the country being 100 years old. There was like an old colonial kitchen there, you know, companies that had displays of say silk weaving ribbons would have ribbons they would give out that had George Washington's picture on them. So I was just telling Victoria, I wonder if some company that made memorial jewelry, you know, had for sale or gave out these brooches that had George and Martha Washington in them. Also, a few years after this was the 150th anniversary of his birth. So that's another option as well. Next slide. So after all of this talk about death and dying, you know, we wanted to leave on a note that reminds us that the reason for all these things is just that we want to stay close to the people that we love that are gone. We want to think that when we are gone, our loved ones will remember this. And I have to give a shout out. I watched a very interesting TED talk by a woman called Ingrid Hansen for TEDx Pittsmoor, which is in Australia. And she was talking about how she had lost her husband. And I think she must be a curator or a freelance curator. And that knowing some of the customs that the Victorians celebrated about their dead comforted her more than the contemporary sense that mourning is something that we're going to deal with and get over with and get back to life as normal. And that there's something was very comforting to her with the idea that, that it's just something that stays with you and that you don't lose touch with the people that you have lost. So I think that's, that's pretty much the close. And I can see from the numbers on my chat here that, it, that we maybe have some questions, Olivia, is that true? Yes, I kind of want to start with the questions that are a little less relevant to morning and more just about um, Glenview. There is one about the mansion's furnishings or the home's furnishings um, and were any of them from the Trevors that we have now? Only a few. Um, when, when the city bought Glenview from the estate of the Trevors, it had been cleaned out. It was an empty house that, that was for sale. And so we do have a few original items. If you want to go back to the picture of the parlor, I think we'd be able to see it. What was in that, like, I don't know, slide five or something. something, yeah. There is one thing that you can see that is original to the house. In the very background underneath that little sculpture of the lady with her hand up in the air on the left, that chair is original to Glenview. So. Some of the things we have were given to us by the Gardner's family. I suspect that over the years, maybe pieces were sold out. There was the worn out. There was a rip in the upholstery or something and they sent it down to the Gardner's cottage. And in 1980, the Gardner's descendants gave us back some things and that's an original chair. So probably the whole set matched that and the set that we have, which is antique, is not their set, but very similar to, to what they had. Mm -hmm. uh, um, we were also talking about while the Trevors were in mourning that they had a rail car sent up um, from Grand Central and someone was wondering if they had their own private rail car or if that was just a rail car that they had. Uh... I think probably the kind of people that had their own private rail cars were in echelon even above the Trevors. I, I don't know exactly how that was arranged, but maybe there were, you know, just like they can put on an extra train car today in Metro North if they need one for some reason or run less of them at times. Maybe there was, they could just run an extra private train car at some point. I, I don't think that the Trevors had their own rail car now. No, okay. Um, now that we're on our slides back here, in slide 13, someone was wondering if that was a child's coffin. 
Oh. It, it looks like it might be, right, Victoria? Very popular. Yeah, it's very, very possible. Um, people were a bit shorter then, but I mean, infant mortality in some areas were up to like 30% and that children didn't live past the age of five. Um, that's for just so many different reasons, um, disease. Um, also during the Victorian time, sometimes you would cut milk with borax um, for children because spoiled milk wasn't understood to have been by bacteria and the borax would kill certain types of bacteria, but then cause a very specific type of, I think, TB that was then prevalent and would just wipe out entire huge sections of the, pop of the population of children. And um, so there's many, many reasons why infant mortality would be very high, yeah. so it's, it's very likely, it's possible. Doctors didn't always wash their hands. I can't remember the exact date when doctors started washing their hands all the time, but uh, there was that. And then I also, during one of the, some of the research I was doing to prepare for this, they were talking about the fact that just, you know how you, know how you sterilize bottles or you have those kind of bottles where you just put a new like inside in it all the time. I mean, they didn't, they didn't have modern knowledge about the necessity of doing things like sterilizing a bottle when you washed it or even washing it. So there were just so many just horribly preventable reasons, uh, horribly horrible reasons that were preventable by modern standards that would be fairly easy if people had only known it would mean children would die. Yes. Yeah. Well, talking about bottles, um, are there any tear bottles in our collection? Oh, I saw this question and I got very excited. So <laughs> none that I know of in our collection. I have one personally um, in my own collection. But um, the question with that is if they were ever actually used. So for those who don't know, tear bottles are these very like long kind of usually cylindrical bottles that are very pretty and kind of decorative. And the kind of folklore around it is that at the funeral, you would collect tears from the family or your own. And then as the tears evaporated, once all of them were gone, your mourning period would be over. So that was kind of the tradition of them. But within finding them, researchers have never really found any actual documentation of their use like that. Never, I think DNA testing has even even found that like, there's no remnants of anything like that in them. Um, so it's kind of contested about whether they actually would have been used. They could have also just, they could have been sold for that reason and had for that reason, but they're not actually used, if that makes any sense. Kind mm -hmm. of just kind of fashionably like, oh, here's my tear bottle, like type of things like that. But um, they're very interesting. I love them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very happy to have gotten one. <laughs> Um, and then we had a bunch of questions about- I, I don't think we have any, by the way. Nothing that I know <laughs> is a tear bottle. We have a hair receiver. I didn't have a picture of it though. It's like a little heart-shaped ceramic thing with a hole in the top to put hair in. But I think that's for saving your hair when you're living to make you know, jewelry out of, not, mm -hmm. not when you're dead. Yeah, we had some questions about widows in mourning and um, let's see. Uh, how long did a widow have to wait to remarry? Um, also, are there any instances of a woman's mourning period being uh, one year, not two? So to my own knowledge, for the second question, for I would believe, I think I've heard of shorter mourning times if the widow was very young. So mm -hmm. she was really young and she could still get married and have a full family. I mean, at that time, women's main goal the main goal for women was to have children and be wives, essentially. So if you were very young, say like in your late teens, maybe your early 20s, and you were already a widow, you, there could have been a good chance that you didn't have to do the entire two years because it would have been two years kind of wasted almost in society's view. Mm -hmm. um, and then what was the other question? Sorry, Olivia. Um, uh, yeah, so... Uh... I, it was uh, how long Mary. did a widow have to wait to marry? Uh, yeah, very, I think it just, it depended on social situation. If you had any suitors, what your family life was like, if you a whole bunch money. of things. If you needed money, yeah. Cause I mean, yeah. women weren't able to work at that time. I mean, one, one thing you have to remember when you're reading, when you're researching things like newspapers or etiquette books or any kind of sources like that you have to 
remember what you're reading. You know, if you're reading a newspaper account, it's only as accurate as whoever like wrote the article. If you're reading an etiquette book, think about it. That doesn't mean that's what everybody did. In fact, it might mean it's not what everybody did so that somebody's writing you advice to correct your bad behavior. So I, I don't think you can read, you know, what was advised in an etiquette book and take it to be factual for what everybody actually did. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so. I had I a feeling there'd be a lot of questions yeah. about this topic. It's a very interesting topic. Um, someone was wondering uh, if a woman was, would be buried usually with her family or with her husband's family. Well, M Mary Trevor was buried with her husband's family, even though it was far away, probably up in Massachusetts somewhere. I mean, I can give that one as an example, as a specific example. Yeah, I think typically once you were married, you were part of your husband's family a little bit more than you were part of your own anymore. So you would be with your husband. And then I think usually, I've seen examples of husbands not being married, but buried with their wives, because if they remarried, they might have been buried then with their wife at the time of their own death. Speaking on that, um, John Trevor was married twice, right? So was his first wife um, buried with him as well, or? You know, I'm sorry, I do not know the answer to that question. I'm sure I could find out. Um, but yes, she died around 1868 and then Mr. Trevor remarried in 1870. Um, yeah, there is a Trevor uh, burial plot at Woodlawn, and we are actually overdue a field trip there. Oh, well, we'll find out Please. soon. That'd be awesome. I love Woodlawn. Yeah, I'll come. <laughs> uh, so there was a question about um, what, about funerals in the home. Um, someone was wondering that if they really didn't hold funerals in churches or were home funerals just most common for the wealthy. To my knowledge, it was really what you did, no matter what, because at that time you took care of your dad. You didn't have, the mortuary business really started springing up late, the, mod, the way we see it modern in modern times, really started springing up after the Civil War and after World War I. So you didn't really have embalming then, you didn't have to deal with um, a mortician to that type of way you would maybe deal with an you would deal with an undertaker for your actual burial and you would deal with clergy for any kind of mass type things mass could be held separately from the funeral the body might not have been moved to the church um so it's kind of like mixing what we're doing now but instead of actually going to a funeral home it would be someone's actual home you kind of have your wake there um that's to my knowledge i think things started moving around when embalming started becoming big um, and then within that, you start getting kind of closer to the modern history, I think, because also with that, with the dawning of modern embalming and the wars, so Civil War and then World War One, you weren't able to take care of your dead because they weren't dying at home. So they were dying overseas. They were dying in another state. Um, you would get the body. It would be pres preserved to the best of their abilities and not by you. So that started really when things started changing and started shifting out of the household. Yeah, I mean, it said also uh, some of the stuff I read that the World War I was really a turning point in terms of the, the mourning attire too, because I mean, the entire country was plunged into mourning and there was just um, a, a change in the idea that everyone was just gonna walk around in mourning attire yeah. all the time. Um, and I was, I was thinking about like language and the fact that we call funeral homes, funeral homes. I was wondering if that is a take, a, you know, holdover from when you would do all these things in your home and instead you have this funeral home to do it in. Um, you were talking a little bit about uh, the idea of mourning changing. Um, and someone was asking, when did black clothing become fashionable? and not necessarily associated with mourning. I saw it? that question come up <laughs> while Victoria was talking. And so I looked it up to remind myself one example I could give. I mean, it does, 
by the end of the 19th century, you do see a lot of very fancy decorative sequined bejeweled outfits that make you think that these clothing was not really meant for mourning. Mm -hmm. And one of the best examples um, I can give, which locks in a date, is a famous portrait by John Singer Sargent called Madame X. It's at the Metropolitan Museum. It's a portrait of Madame Gautreau in France. And um, it's from the early 1880s. And she's wearing this magnificent a uh, plunging neckline black ball gown. And I don't think she was in mourning. You know, you do start to see by the end of the 19th century, black also being worn just fashionably. But I think it clinches it in the post uh, World War I period where you have Chanel and the little black dress. You know, we all have a little black dress still, you know, a hundred years after that. And um, yeah, I think it's kind of gradual, but by the early 20th century, for sure, you see people wearing black for other reasons. Well, I think um, those are all the questions I have for now. Um, you guys are welcome to continue asking questions. Sarah Linda has also been posting a few links on some of the topics that we've been talking about in the chat. There's one on the history of hand washing and um, she posted one just from the Met just now. Um, and if, uh, Laura, you have any closing statements for us for today? I just want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank you for supporting the museum and for being interested in Glenview Mansion and all these topics that we have exploring this really rich area. As I said, I think the Victorian period is not just something that we study in the abstract as being an olden time. So many of the things that relate to our lives today stem from this period. And I think, um, you know, the way we deal with death and dying is, is certainly one of them. We may have been inspired to have this event by the fact that we're closing in on Halloween, but we don't really mean to be morbid. We mean to be inspiring and instructive. <laughs> now, Laura and Victoria, um, I really wanna thank both of you so much. This is as, as the audience has said, it's just so fascinating and the way you presented it was so respectful and um, it's interesting. It's just important to keep in mind that um, human beings deal with death in many different ways and we have much more in common with each other, I think, both across the globe and across, across history than you know, we might otherwise think. Um, and, and this time of year when, you know, we, we think about the harvest is ending and the year is waning, we tend to think about these things a lot. And one way is through Halloween, which is uh, more, more of a fun way to, to thumb your nose at these things. And, and I, again, I do invite everybody to, to um, go online. And if you're interested, buy a ticket for this Friday's program, um, which is going to be Halloween storytelling and sky talk under the full moon. And since it is live and outdoors, it is subject to weather, but we do hope to see you. Um, uh, adults uh, uh, get a, 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 a glass, not a bottle, but a glass of uh, hard cider with their ticket. Uh, so that should be lots of fun. And then on the other hand, on Sunday, actually all weekend, but particularly on Sunday, we celebrate Dia de Muertos, um, which will expose people to another, uh, another way that, um, that cultures, particularly, especially in Mexico, deal with losing their loved ones. So um, whatever you do, whenever you come, we are welcome you, and uh, we're glad to see you virtually and also in person. And thank you all so much again for being here and also for all the information in the chat. Yeah, I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I know, thanks for sharing. Yes, thank you. Okay, All and right, thank everybody. You. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> Take care, everybody.